Good evening, everybody. How are you doing tonight? Good. Welcome to Mount Hall Community Church, and this is our midweek survey through the Bible. Are you guys ready to worship the Lord? And welcome to you that are watching online also. It's nice to be with you this evening. It's a beautiful day up here in far north Idaho with temperatures just below 90 degrees, and my raspberries are already turning ripe. Yeah, wouldn't you like, guys like to pick in my yard? But you'll have to deal with the uh, mosquitoes, of course. Anyway, let's pray and let's start her off, shall we? Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you and praise you for this time that we have to spend with you, Lord. And Father, as we lift up our voices in song to you right now, let everything that we do, let everything that is done here this evening magnify and glorify you. Let everything be an act of worship unto your throne. Lord, as we get into your word here in just a little bit, Lord, I ask that that would even be an act of worship. We thank you for your mercy and for your grace, that you are such a good God, and that everything that is going on right now is planned and under your control. We pray, Father, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly, come and get us. So, Father, during this time, help us to set aside everything that's going on and just focus on you right here, right now. We thank you and praise you. We ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. And we're blessed to have Miss Linda with us this evening. Gil is still recuperating, watching a bad movie at home. But uh, let's worship the Lord, shall we? My poor honey. <laughs> Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life That I would be set free Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Who brings our chaos Back into order Who makes the orphan A son and daughter The King of glory the King of glory. Who rules the nation with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You laid down your life, that I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me.
make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sinner, wake up the saints. Let every nation shout of your fame. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing, even so come, Lord Jesus come even so come Lord Jesus come there will be justice all will be new your name forever faithful and true Jesus is coming soon Like a bride waiting for her groom, we'll be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we sing, even so come, Lord Jesus come, even so come. Lord Jesus, come. So we wait, we wait for you. God, we wait, you're coming soon. So we wait, we wait. We wait your coming soon Like a bride waiting for her groom We'll be a church ready for you Every heart longing for our King We sing like a bride So come, Lord Jesus, come. Even so come, Lord Jesus, Bye. 
the soul and I never ever have to be afraid one thing remains in death in life I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love my debt is paid it's nothing and separate my heart from your great love in death in life i'm confident and covered by the power of your great love my debt is paid there's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love your love never fails never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails never gives up never runs out on me your love never fails never gives up never runs out on me your love Thank you, Lord, that you're coming for us soon. And we expectantly wait for you, Lord. And as we do, Lord, we occupy this time, Lord, and ask God that your Holy Spirit come upon us, that we be able to learn of you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Awesome time of worship.
Hey, turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. What was last month? Anybody remember? June. Every time you turned on the television set, what did you see on all the apps on your TV or on all the commercials? Anybody? How about rainbows? It was Pride Month, remember? You had rainbows all over the place. But who does that rainbow belong to? God, right. It's been hijacked, exactly right. And as Christians today, we need to take the rainbow back because we're going to be talking about the rainbow this evening. And the rainbow belongs to God, and it actually represents his very nature. Uh, an author by the name of Ken Hutcherson said, Let's take back the rainbow for God. Let the homosexual community find a different religious symbol to commandeer. What I want is for the Christian community to wake up, wipe the sleep from their eyes, and realize they're in a spiritual battle that isn't going away and has no demilitarized zone, no DMZ. The rainbow is a symbol, but its meaning points to the very character of God. So Christian, use this God-given symbol for his glory. Using it won't make you a homosexual. And that's true. So as Christians, we need to take it back. It belongs to God. And it is a beautiful thing. That rainbow in the sky is God's promise. We'll be talking about that this evening. Genesis chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth, and on all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs, but you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely for your life blood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I will establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth, Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud, and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it on both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew that his younger brother had done to him, knew what his younger brother had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants. He shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. 
So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. Father God, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you and praise you for this time to study your word. We thank you for uh, being able to read about the life of this incredible servant. And Lord, we want to be your servants today, Lord. We ask that you would have your way in our lives and in our hearts right now, that you would open up the word to our eyes, give us eyes to see, ears to hear your voice. I pray, Father, that you would fill me and fill my brothers and sisters with your Holy Spirit. Fill us afresh, Father. Lead us and guide us, Father. And I pray if I say anything that is not of you, it falls to the ground unheard. We thank you and praise you. We ask it all in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Kind of a funny story, <clears throat> but when I was uh, younger, and my son was quite a bit younger than he is today, he was a little guy, uh, we used to have a Royal Ranger troop at our church, Calvary Chapel Phelan. And one particular summer, we went on a camp out in a place called Afton Canyon. And if you're from Southern California, perhaps you're familiar with it. It's kind of halfway between Barstow and Las Vegas. It sits at about 5,000 foot elevation up in the high desert. And there are mountains up in there. And it's pretty desolate, um, mostly rattlesnakes and things like that. But on this particular camp out, up on top of the one, one of the mountains, when we took a hike, we started digging in one of the rocks. And this is quite a bit above, ele above sea level, as I said, about 5,000 foot. And we found in the rock, there were fossilized remains of a fish way up there on top of this mountain. Evidence of a worldwide flood that had taken place. Because that area had not been under, under the sea, at least as far in, as uh, recent history that I know of. So it had to be that. Now, last Thursday, we were in chapter 8, and we studied where the ark landed on Mount Ararat. God let Noah and his family out of the ark. Remember, it was God that brought them in, and he shut them in. They didn't do it on their own. What's the first thing that Noah did? He built an altar. He stacked up all these stones, and he made a sacrifice. He had a barbecue to God, didn't he? And the smell of this barbecue, the smell of that meat on the grill, it kind of drifted up to the nostrils of God up in heaven, and it covered up the stench of all the sin of mankind. So God promised that he would never again destroy the earth with water. Now next time, he's going to destroy it with fire. But that's a different subject altogether. Now we move on to chapter 9 of Genesis. My message title this evening is The Rainbow. The Rainbow that we already started talking about. So let's begin. Genesis chapter 9 beginning at verse 1. So God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And that means the whole earth, not just part of it. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth and all the fish of the sea, they are given into your hand. So if you're walking around out in your yard, and we all live in North Idaho up here, and you happen to see, like I saw this morning, out at my bird feeder once again was a, uh, a doe and her fawn. And our deer in our yard are still pretty tame. I can get pretty close to them. But when th that deer saw me stand up to go refill our coffee cups, she watched every move that I made through our, our uh, window. Because there's a fear that's built into animals of man. We're different. We're a different kind of predator, aren't we? We're at the top of the food chain. Also, think about if I was talking to Lee before the service. He's got a great fisherman shirt on. If you're going out fishing and you're fishing a stream bank and you happen to come on some brook trout or some rainbow in a hole, they are very particular and they actually look up through the water and if they see a shadow, they'll bolt, they'll, they'll swim off. They, they are very fearful of anything that's around them. So it's the same thing. God has put a fear into all the wildlife that's around us. We're at the top. They're fearful of us. And what's it say? They are given into our hand. The Lord blessed Noah because he built an altar. That's the first thing Noah did. And Noah blessed God. What's it mean to be blessed? Pleased, happy. So it made him happy, which it means it made God happy. And for us as Christians today, we can choose to bless the Lord by sacrificing our time and our efforts to serve him and to serve our brothers and sisters around us. Just like Noah, we can be blessed. And this is a principle that we have to remember, too. When we give to the Lord, does he give back? Absolutely, right? We cannot possibly outgive God. 
Not, that's not the way it works. God will always give back more than what we give to him. Now Noah here is told to start over again, just as God also told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply. Now Noah and his sons are told the same thing. They're given the same command. This time, however, the earth is no longer paradise. It's also not hell. Now due to our perpetual tendency to sin, it, our planet is not what it used to be, even today. Certainly not in Adam's day, and of course it wasn't as good as going all the way back to the beginning in the Garden of Eden. But it's still not bad. We have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? Especially where we live up here. This should be a reminder to all of us. We may not think that our life is going great. However, it's much, much better than what we deserve. If we were to ask for justice as sinners, as sinful creatures, all of us are, what would justice mean for us? Death. Because if we sin even once, one small sin, it's as if we had committed all of them. And we'd be guilty of that sin. So justice is what we would have deserved, and justice means death. But Jesus covered all of that on the cross. Now someday we're going to go to heaven, and heaven is going to make even the beauty that's behind me pale in comparison. Heaven is going to be right, and everything is going to be perfect. In the meantime, here on planet Earth, here in North Idaho, we have much to be thankful for. Now, the scripture that we're reading here this evening is known as the Noah Covenant. The Noah Covenant. We've studied this before. A covenant is an agreement or a treaty between two parties. And typically speaking, they would slaughter a, a bull. They would cut it right down the middle from head to tail. And the two parties would walk in between that bull and they would kind of shake on it. And if either party broke their end of the agreement, the, the agreement was... Let the same thing be done to me as what was done to that bull. In this particular case, this covenant is made by God, and it's a different kind of covenant. It's not an agreement. It's a proclamation. What God is saying here is, this is what I'm going to do for you, Noah, and your children, regardless of what you guys do. Now, there's other covenants that are conditional. An example of that is the children of Israel, when they came into God's rest, when they came into the promised land, they were told that God would bless them and their offspring and they would stay in the land as long as they followed after God and his precepts and didn't follow after other gods. Did they keep it? No, they didn't. They blew it, didn't they? Mightily. So the northern kingdom went first into the Assyrian captivity and then the southern kingdom of Judah went after them about 150, 160 years after. And they went into Babylon. Now, the difference between the two is the northern kingdom never came back, but Judah did come back, uh, keeping their Jewish identity. And from Judah, we get the term known today, uh, kind of like a, a nickname for the Jewish people. It's known as Jews, from Judah. So, our, let's see, God told Israel that he would bless them and plant them in that land, provided that they forsook all those gods, all those other gods. So they broke that covenant. They didn't keep it. Now, the gods that they were following in the land of Canaan, I want to point this out. We'll be talking about it in just a couple of minutes. Um, they were not a shepherd god, like Jehovah God, what, Yahweh God. As he led the people of Israel across the wilderness, it was as is God was the shepherd and the people were the sheep. In the Bible, we're often referred to as sheep, aren't we? And that's a pretty good description because as people, we're always looking for someone to follow. There's a lot of leaders out there. Sometimes good, there's good leaders and there's bad leaders. But we truly are a people. We're sheep. But the other gods that were already in the land of Canaan, they were agrarian gods. They were fertility gods. And so as we talk about meat here in just a little bit, the sacrifice that would be made to these gods, this is typically Baal and Asherah, it would be designed to get these two gods to consummate their relationship, which would make the ground fertile and make their crops grow. So we're talking about bread, we're talking about grain, barley, wheat, vegetables, things like that, as opposed to meat. So what we're going to be talking about tonight is meat. God gave the people of Israel, and he gave Noah and his sons, he told them, meat, eat meat. So in the New Covenant, God says, no longer will my words be external, but internal. So this is a change here. In the Bible, we see, uh, talking about these covenants, there are eight of them. And it starts right here, and it goes all the way. What's the last covenant? The New Covenant. The New Covenant is what we call in our Bible the New Testament, isn't it? 
It's a new agreement, and Jesus, he became our Lamb of God. Instead of the bull, he was the lamb that was sacrificed on that cross because, again, God knew that we wouldn't be able to keep the agreement. And after Jesus, God writes his laws and his precepts. He puts his will on our heart. They're no longer written on stone, tablets of stone, are they? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16 says, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. So the Noah covenant we see in our text this evening is broken into three distinct separate parts. Number one, the first part of it, if you're a note taker, is diet. Number two is discipline, and lastly is declaration. So we have diet, discipline, and declaration. And how interesting that that last component, that our God, he is a jealous God. He wants us to declare him. He wants us to proclaim him. He wants us to take a stand for him, doesn't he? If somebody comes up and says, are you one of those born-agains? Are you one of those xenophobic Christians, those haters? Don't you dare say no. Don't you dare deny him. Say, well, that's not exactly the way I look at it, but yes, I am. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Never, ever deny the Lord because the Lord wants us to be proud of him. He wants us to follow him and to claim him in name. He wants us all to himself. Verse 3, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs, but you shall not eat flesh with its life. That is its blood. Remember as we read this, Noah lived before the law was given. This is a long time before the law was given to Moses. And yet what we're talking about here, this is pre-law, but these same precepts we see later when the law is actually written down. God has already given this principle to Noah. And the blood, that's called the life force, that belongs to God. So when we're talking about sacrifices, if, if Noah is doing that sacrifice on the altar that we talked about a minute ago, then the blood was to be drained out and poured out on the ground. Same thing when they were in the tabernacle. The blood went into the ground. Later on, when the temple was built, they actually had a plumbing system from the temple that went down into the Kidron Valley and it emptied out. The blood went into the ground. It went into the creek. The blood always belongs to God. What's the other thing that belongs to God? Think about the barbecue. Think about you're having that ribeye steak on the grill. That's right, the fat. That's what starts that grill firing it up. And you have to really watch that steak because if the fire fires up too much, you're going to burn that steak, aren't you? It will be a burnt, uh, burnt offering. And at $12 a pound, you don't want that to happen. You want to save that steak. So the fat belongs to God, just like the blood belongs to God. Now God is saying, you guys have gone long enough without meat. It's time for a big old fat daddy hamburger. Now nothing against vegetarians if you happen to be one, but there are many cultures out there today that are pagan and they do not allow the eating of meat. One that comes to mind is if you go to India, the Hindus, they look at animals like they, they're gods or, or previous ancestors. They don't eat meat, they practice vegetarianism and that actually, there's a lot of witchcraft and demon possession that goes along with that. The Bible actually warns of this. So if you hold your place there in Genesis, turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, if you would please. First Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Now the Spirit, and that's the Holy Spirit, expressly says that in latter times, when did latter times start? When Jesus, with Jesus. So we're still, we're in the latter of the latter times right now. In latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy. What's hypocrisy? Putting on a show, being two-faced, acting. Uh, someone who is two-faced. Do you trust someone that's two-faced? They say one thing, but they do another? That's not a good thing, is it? Being a hypocrite. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. Yeah, that sounds like all of government right now. Having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. 
For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Now that word that's used there for food in the Greek is the word bromo, or broma, excuse me, and it literally means meat. It means meat. It doesn't mean vegetables. It doesn't mean bread. It doesn't mean grain. It means meat. Now, what do we see on the news going on today, going on with people, maybe animal rights people? So we, we've seen in the last few months all these food processing plants that have mysteriously burned down. You guys remember seeing about that? We see people that are saying all the time, meat is murder. Animals have rights. You can't kill them. If a woman happens to wear a real fur coat, yeah, it's funny. One day I was walking along, Cheryl and I were down at the beach, I think it was San Juan Capistrano, we went in a thrift store, and they had this mink stole that uh, she could get around her neck. Now, she, there's no place that you can really wear one unless you go someplace real fancy, and there's not many fancy places that we, we can wear one up here, but I bought it. I wanted to buy her a real fur something or other. But if you go in some places, if you go in, in maybe downtown L.A. or New York or Chicago, you're very liable to be attacked if you're wearing a mink coat or any type of a fur coat. And all these crazies will come out and accuse you of being a murderer. They might throw red paint on you. Now, what else do we see going on right now in the news in our world having to do with meat? How about global warming? You guys seen that? You can't have a steak because all those cows, when they pass gas, that's increasing the core temperature of planet Earth. Have you ever heard so much nonsense in your entire life? Stay out of my refrigerator, dude. There is no way that cattle and cows and oxen and deer, all these things that God created, is doing anything whatsoever to the temperature of the earth. But this stuff is crazy. And what's even weirder is that people believe that garbage. They follow it. It's insanity. But that's just exactly what the Bible calls it. They call it a doctrine of demons. Because that's what's happening. There's a deeper meaning be besides all the stuff that we see on the news. This is a battle for the minds of, of people. The devil is trying to draw as many over to his side as he possibly can, including well-meaning people during these last days. It's truly a doctrine of demons. Okay, what else? During Jesus' earthly ministry, he built his instruction to his disciples around fellowship. If you read through the Bible... And you see where Jesus is interacting with his men. He's always asking them, you got anything to eat? It was all built around food, wasn't it? Everywhere we go, Jesus is, is breaking bread with people. Luke chapter 24, verse 40. When he had said this, he showed them, and this is right after the resurrection, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of a, a broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate in their presence. Again, the word that's used there for food means meat. It means solid food. It means protein. All that will sustain us. All this goes to say, and no, no, no offense if you actually follow a vegetarian diet, but if you don't, don't let anyone shame you in thinking that you're doing something wrong if you have a hamburger. When they say meat is bad, meat is evil, Remember, it's a doctrine of demons. This is something that has been uh, prophesied about since the foundation of the earth and something that the devil was trying to turn people against. Verse 5, back in our text. Surely for your life blood, I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast, I will require it. And from the hand of man, from the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. So the second element, again, with God's covenant with Noah, is discipline. Discipline. And this has to do with law, the administration of justice, our government, our foundation, if you will. God tells us that if one man kills another, that man's life will be required of him what we would call capital punishment. Because man is made in the image of God. So an assault on man is actually an assault on God and his image, by extension. 
So this is administration of justice, and we see that laid out in Genesis chapter 9. Now, what do we see in our world today? As scholars debate whether or not it's humane to have capital punishment, philosophers argue about it, but you as a Christian, if you happen to support capital punishment, they will throw it up in your face. Well, wait a minute, I thought you said that you're pro-life. How can you possibly do that and be pro-life when it comes to a baby, but you want to kill this poor person over here? Because God is a God of order, God is a God of justice. It's a completely different thing. It's apples and oranges, isn't it? Now, this is the average thing, the, this principle that God lays out is the fact that capital punishment or the fear of being put to death if you kill somebody stops more murders. It actually stops it. If people are afraid that if I go commit that robbery and that murder, I'm also going to, going to fry. I'm going to die for that. It's a deterrent to actually doing that. Now, moving away from capital punishment in our society, what have we seen? What do we see in the news right now? It has a domino effect, doesn't it? Everything has a tendency to fall apart, all society. So in Los Angeles County right now, down in Southern California, what do you see with the DA? A guy named Gascon, who supposedly used to be a police officer. Everything is just in disorder. It's falling apart. There is no fear whatsoever of law enforcement. There is no fear of the law. And criminals are actually controlling and roaming the streets. The criminals grow increasingly aggressive and evil prevails. It used to be if a person committed first degree murder, they would be facing the death penalty. If it was second degree murder, they'd be looking to 20 to 30 years in prison. If you were talking about a robbery or rape, 10 to 20 years. But now, many of what used to be called felonies, including auto theft and robbery, if it's not involving a weapon, that robbery, force or fear, in other words, it can be a strong arm robbery, that's being reduced to things like misdemeanors in some of our bigger cities. No cash bail, people are being let out. There is no fear of the law and the criminal rules and reigns on the street. And it sends a message that crime really does pay. If there's no fear of the administration, of justice, if there's no fear of the government. So we're living in a time when it was very, very similar to the ways that things were right before the flood of Noah, where evil ruled and reigned on the earth. Now God gave man after the flood the responsibility of government. And he included that fundamental principle that if a man committed murder, that man's life would be required of him. Now you might say, come on, Bob. That's eye, that eye for an eye stuff, that's Old Testament, right? Well, consider what God says in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, verse 4 says, For he, and this is the police officer, it's God's minister for you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Now that phrase, execute wrath, is understood by Greek scholars to mean that law enforcement has the authority to use deadly force or capital punishment upon the criminal who is deserving of it. So if a criminal uses a weapon to uh, threaten the life of that officer, let's say, or any other person, then uh, deadly force or capital punishment may be used in defense of that other, that other life to stop it. Therefore, capital punishment is not just an Old Testament principle, but also a New Testament principle, a precept. Verse 8, Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I will establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth, Thus I will establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off, and that means killed, by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Let me stop there for a second. Do we still have floods today? Yes, we do. Regional floods. But we will never again, according to God's word, have a worldwide catastrophic flood that kills all human life. Verse 12. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. That means it keeps going and going and going. I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth 
that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. So the third and final element of God's covenant with Noah is a declaration. God is declaring it. He is saying that he will never again destroy the entire earth, all flesh, with water. And God highlights or underlines or puts with all caps his commitment with a memorial in the sky. Now, a memorial is something that's like when God says, I will remember. God, of course, doesn't forget a thing. God knows everything. There's nothing that we can show him. But it's a picture for us. It's kind of like a road marker as we drive along a highway and we're looking for a landmark, some place to turn left at. God puts it, puts it there in Scripture for us to remember it. Remember, God always wants us to remember, never to forget. The devil is the one that wants us to forget things. If the devil can get us to forget how good God has been, then he can twist things and take us off course. God wants us to remember. So God puts a reminder in the sky, and it comes in the form of a bow. And now, if you were looking in the King James Version of the Bible, it would say just that, a bow, like a war bow. But in this case, it says a rainbow. It's the emblem. What does that rainbow uh, stand for? God's grace. It stands for his grace, his unmerited favor. And so when we come out of a storm, gang, and let's face it, we all go through storms. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you saw the prayer request that came this morning. Terrible, terrible news about a, a brother in our fellowship. When we go through a storm like that, God is always faithful one way or another to get us through that storm. So when we come out of a storm and we look up in the clouds, what's in the clouds? Water vapor, of course we know that when that's what helps make that rainbow. Science tells us that. But what else does the cloud represent? To God, his Shekinah glory. The cloud always represents the glory of God. God filled the temple with a cloud when he appeared. God is going to come once again. Jesus will come in the clouds when he raptures us home. And we will return with Jesus in great glory at the second coming, uh, Jesus' second coming, not the same as the rapture, and that will again be in the cloud. Heaven will be opened up and the clouds will descend. It always represents the glory of God. So God places that rainbow up there and it is not a representation of the homosexual community. It has nothing to do with it. Now that goes back probably 25 years and they adopted that saying, well, God's a God of love. He loves all people. And that's right. But when we start looking at what God defines man as, what does God say? How did he create us? Male and female. Does God make mistakes? No, he does not. So when somebody says, I feel like I'm a man trapped in a woman's body or vice versa, that's like saying, God, you don't know what you're doing. So what we see is a, really a very, very small percentage of people that identify in the homosexual community. But what we see, like in our library, is that small percentage is actually trying to cultivate and culture our youth into saying, this is okay, why don't you try it? Why don't you come over to that? That is completely unacceptable. Because I believe that God allows people to choose, even if they choose sin and death, that's up to them to choose. But when you try to drag somebody else into that lifestyle, what does the Bible say when you harm one of these little ones? What happens? It's better that a millstone be tied around your neck and you be thrown into the sea than anyone that would harm one of these little ones. So God puts the rainbow up on, uh, up on the sky as a reminder that when we ask Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior, that represents his mercy and grace. And never again will he destroy planet Earth with water. The rainbow belongs to God. It represents his grace, his mercy, his unmerited, undeserved favor. And the clouds also always represent the Shekinah glory of God. So the bow, notice which, when you see a rainbow in the sky, which direction is the rainbow pointed? It's looping this way, isn't it? So if that were a bow, like an archer's bow that it represents, 
that arrow would go up, not down, right? So why do you think that is? God's already fired that arrow, hasn't he? It's, been, it's one and done. It's already been used. So the rainbow is, is pointed the other direction. It's not a threat, but it's a reminder that once again, God is good. He will not destroy us. He's declaring that. So the rabbis point to that fact. God's already fired that, that arrow. Never again will he use it. It's kind of like our peonies that we plant out in the garden or our lilacs that bloom up here in the spring. They bloom and they're done, right? One and done. That's, my wife always complains about that. I just wish the lilacs would last a little longer. So the rainbow is the same way. It's already happened. That arrow will never be fired at us again. Verse 18. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. And Noah began to be a farmer. Now some of your translations may say husbandry or a husbandman. And he planted a vineyard. It just means a farmer. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. So this is a message for us too. Every time we think that things are going really, really well, we're riding on the cloud, the, the uh, ark has landed on top of a mountain, the skies have cleared, the sun's out, the birds are singing. Uh, one of those birds that we love to hear up here, it sounds like they're saying, cheeseburger, cheeseburger. We love to hear that bird. Anyway, when things are going really, really right, we need to be careful because that's usually when the attacks begin. That's when something bad is going to happen. So in our Christian walk, we're either going through a valley where things are really, really tough, or we're, as we're going out of that valley, we're going up to a mountain where everything's really, really good, a mountaintop experience. So we're always, as Christians, one or the other. Either things are really, really good or really, really bad. Oh, Pastor Bob, I need prayer right now. It's, it always is. And so it doesn't matter which one we're on, prepare for the other one. So we see this quizzical statement right here in the middle of it, that Ham is the father of Canaan. Why is that there? It seems kind of out of order. It's not really clear yet, but soon in our study it will become clear. The people of Canaan, they're going to be cursed. They are going to find themselves in opposition to God's precepts. They're going to find themselves in rebellion to God's plan. And you might say this is another one of those memorial markers. So it's like, it's like uh, what's his name, Nabal in the Old Testament. How would you like to know that your name went down in infamy throughout the Bible? And everyone, every time they get, come to that point in Scripture, there's that guy Nabal again in the Bible. What's his name mean? Fool. Fool. Remember him? His wife's name was Abigail and she saved him. Well, this is one of those markers once again. So all of this takes place because Ham, his dad, sins. He sins against his dad. And by sinning against his dad, he's also sinning against God. So Noah gets involved in husbandry. And that doesn't mean he takes on more wives. It just means he tills the ground. He becomes a farmer. And he learns how to grow grapes. And he makes grape juice, which ferments. So when you make wine... What do you need to cause that, that grape juice to ferment? Huh? Yeast. Some, some of you guys have made wine before. That's exactly what, right. In the Bible, what does yeast represent? Sin. Exactly right. So the yeast causes it to ferment. And what else when you, you're making wine that you have to add? Otherwise, the wine will be very, very sour. It'll be very, very dry and sharp. What do you need in that wine? Sugar, lots of sugar, a whole bunch of sugar. So if you're on a ketogenic diet, would you want to have a glass of wine? Probably not. It will break your diet. And that sugar covers up the really awful, awful taste of what wine really tastes like. When I worked in the, in the county jail as a young deputy sheriff, we would always catch the inmates when they were in there trying to smuggle pieces of fruit out of the chow hall and back into their cells, and they would make this stuff called pruno. They, it was like a, a hooch, and it was terrible stuff. It stunk to high heaven when we'd find it, and we'd do cell block shakes and find that stuff all the time. So it's really, really bad. So it causes the grape juice to sour and become corrupt. It becomes alcoholic. So 
As a matter of fact, people who are vinters who make wine, they have to add that lots and lots of sugar to make it taste somewhat good. So too much wine is a bad thing. What's wine represent in the Bible? We've talked about that before. Anyone remember? Think about the marriage at supper at Cana. Joy. It represents joy. So wine is a good thing, except if you drink too much of it. Then it becomes sin, doesn't it? And you are no longer in control. You're not in control of yourself. Instead of being under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you're under the influence of another spirit, and you do stupid stuff. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says, Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with what? The Holy Spirit. Be filled with him. Don't be filled with, with drunkenness. When Noah drinks too much wine, he passes out. And then he is uncovered. He's naked. Noah is no longer in charge of his own facilities. He is just laying out there and laying out for everybody to see him. And Ham is about to sin. Now, this is an act of disrespect towards his father and rebellion to Father God as well. So in the Bible, when, that, when you're uncovered, that nakedness, think about all the way back to Adam and Eve. What did they, Adam and Eve, what did they become aware of when they were first naked? They were ashamed, weren't they? They had to cry and cover themselves up with fig leaves. And God covered their sin with animal skins. Blood was required to cover all that up. So our nakedness represents our sin and our shame that's uncovered. And rather than covering up his dad's sin and his shame, he mocked him. He made fun of him. Verse 22, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside, Hey, you see, Dad? Look at him. <laughs> Verse 23, But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. The, another thing that nakedness in the Bible uh, represents, it could also be sexual abuse. Now, we don't have any indication that Noah was sexually abused, but it's thought that it was possible. He, he may have even been, been sexually abused by his son. We don't know. So Ham exposes his father's nakedness. Now, we don't know what exactly happened, but we do know that he was mocked by his son. And it was kind of like Ham saying to his dad, oh, some kind of leader you are some kind of godly man you are, have you ever been caught in a circumstance where you suddenly looked very much like a hypocrite? You ever made a mistake and you've blown it and somebody says, really, you're a Christian? Well, this is the same kind of thing. So Noah, he, he must have thought that when he did this, hey, look, I'm trying out my winemaking. Isn't this cool? He might, might have thought I have some degree of privacy here. You might even say he might have thought that he was off duty, right? He's done his job. He built the ark. He got them where they needed to be. I'm going to have a, have a couple glasses of wine. But for a Christian, are we really ever off duty? No. Even when we think no one is watching, someone's always watching, aren't they? There's always someone paying attention. And someone who is not a Christian, when they see hypocrisy in us, they're the first ones that point at us and say, look at you. There's nothing different from you than anybody else. So we want as Christians to always represent our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ well. Because if our reputation is sullied, so is his. It really is. They're not judging us so much as they're judging Jesus. And you and I, sometimes we're the only Jesus that people will ever see. So we want to rightly represent him with our whole lives. Now Shem and Japheth, they chose a much better way. They actually honor their father. They turn the other way. They back up with a garment so they can't see him, and they cover him. So there, the father is the head. He's in the top of the chain of command. He's head of the household. So by honoring their father, who else are they also honoring? God. Again, Noah is made in God's image. So they're, they're helping their father, they're honoring God at the same time. Verse 24, so Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, cursed be Cain, or Canaan, excuse me, a servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. So check this out, Ham is the one that sinned, right? And yet it's his son Canaan that's going to pay the price for it. He's going to be the one that feels the pain of the rebuke. 
Now, we see the same thing repeated today by the children of alcoholics, don't we? Anyone here a, a child of an alcoholic besides me? Yeah. And what do we do when we grow up? Become alcoholics. If you were in an, an abusive household where you saw your mom and your dad argue, very, very likely, it's called a cycle, you will marry someone who was also an abuser. I saw it again and again on family fights as a police officer. And you have to break that cycle of violence. You really have to get out of it. So in my law enforcement career, I saw this with abusers. I saw this with alcoholics. Even though the people didn't intend to do it, they ended up becoming like their mother and father, often marrying those abusers as well. That's what sin does. When I sin, it doesn't just affect me, but it affects those people that are around me. It has an impact, and it's not a good thing. Verse 26, And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Now check that out. Father God, Jehovah God, is identified as the God of whom? Shem. So from Shem, we get the nation of Israel. If you've ever heard the term anti-Semitic, it probably should be anti-Shemitic, but that's what it's standing for. It's talking about the, the line of Shem in, when you're talking about a Semite. That's what the, really the same thing. So Shem, not Sem, but Shem is the father of the Jewish people. Who else is he the father of? The Arab peoples. They're also from the line of Shem. So when we're talking about anti-Semites, are people ever attacking Arabs? No, they're not. So what, really what we're talking about, when we're talking about persecution, and we're not talking about persecution against Arab peoples or Palestinians, we're talking about persecution against the Jews. So it really ought to be talking about anti-Jewish behavior, anti-Jew as opposed to generically Shem. Now moving on to Ham. The name Ham means two things. It means black and it means hot, both of which describe the continent of Africa. And the people of Africa come from the line of Ham. They settled in Africa. Some of those descendants also moved on to the South Pacific, to places like Tonga and uh, Samoa. And if you look at the, the character features of a lot of people, you can see where people's moved around. You can see their features, how, uh, what lines people come from. Now, today, we're all mixed up. There are people from all over the place, and we're all mixed up. We're a bunch of mutts but we go different places. Over the centuries, some have said that Ham was cursed, and it plays right into racism against blacks, against Af uh, Africans. The Bible doesn't say that Ham was cursed, does it? It says Canaan was cursed, not Ham. There was no curse against Ham, nothing against Ham. So this was the people that God instructed the Israelites, talking about Canaan, the people of Canaan, when God took Israel out of their Egyptian captivity and brought them into the promised land, he said, drive them out, wipe them out, let no, let no one live. Why was that? Did he not like that tribe of people? It had to do with their sin. It had to do with their sin. They had sinned so much. They had turned their back on God. They were sacrificing their own children to all these false gods. And the smell, the stench of their sin had grown so bad that God couldn't take it anymore. And there he said, I'm going to put them out of their misery. Verse 27, May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. What a lifespan. Wow. So who is Japheth the father of? Europeans. Europeans is right. Actually, most of China, they, some of them might have gone from Japheth. They, they split up. It will look more as we get into uh, uh, more into Genesis. But for the most part, Japheth goes up into Europe. So if you have Spanish or German or English, Italian, any of these peoples, you came from Japheth. Most of us in this room come from Japheth. So this is the Greeks, the Romans, the Franks, the Vikings, the Saxons. So as the centuries over, unfold in front of us, the people of Japheth end up becoming the dominant of the three sons. They are the ones that start empires, and they're conquering the whole world. 
and they're going in and they're go going back to Africa and planting colonies, such as the Dutch, what they did down there, the English. And so they became dominant for a long period of time. Now, what does it say about that? It says that Japheth will be in the tents of whom? Of Shem. So what do we see today? What is the church primarily made up of? Jews or Gentiles? Gentiles, mostly non-Jews. So we're covered. We're going to be in the tent. <coughs> excuse me. We're in the tents of Shem. We're covered by that. And you see that Japheth gets redeemed through the Jewish people. Kind of cool. So all of our foundation as Christians today, it comes out of Judaism, doesn't it? That's why we read the Old Testament in addition to the New Testament. Our foundation as Christians comes from Judah, the people of Shem. They, we dwell in their tents. We're part of their vine. We get nourished through them. Romans chapter 11, verse 16. For if the first fruit is holy, referring to Israel, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. We're the branches. They're the root. And if some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. So we're grafted in to their family. We're in their tent, so to speak. Now, as we know, where the different people groups are destined and where they're all going to go, Next week, we enter into a very exciting part of Scripture. We start, and it's a short time after the flood now, and we see that rebellion against God is already starting. Now, in earnest, it really starts getting hot and heavy in the next chapter, and then also in chapter 11. So, this evening, as we close during this last song, I'm going to ask Linda to come back up here. If you have never asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, let me introduce you to him tonight. And if you have prayer needs, a lot going on right now, as we close during this last song, come on down and let me pray for you. So shall we stand together right now and let's pray together as we close. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you for your word. And I thank you, Lord, that your word is just as applicable to us today as it was back then. Thank you, Lord, for having your mercy and your grace flow to all of us in this room. Father, I just uh, give you all the glory and the honor. And as we close right now in song, Father, uh, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if there's someone here this evening and you have never committed yourself to Jesus Christ before, do it right now. What have you got to lose? No one is watching, only I. If that's you, raise up your hand so I can see it. Is there anybody, anyone at all? It's as simple as just saying, Jesus, I believe, and I want you in my life right now. Anyone at all, anybody at all. Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord, and we lift up our voices to you right now. And we ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. Thank you for this evening, Lord. I pray for my brothers and sisters right now. Lord, as we go our separate ways, I ask that you would watch over and protect them, keep them safe on the roads, Lord. And Father, as we walk out through these doors, I pray that we would be your hands and feet, that you would use us in a mighty way to reach the people of this community for Jesus Christ. We thank you and praise you, Lord, and we give it all to you. We give you all the glory, and we ask it all in Jesus' holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Have a great evening, everybody. God bless you, and I'll see you on Sunday. Also, don't forget, Saturday for Brother Pete Leonard, there'll be a potluck immediately after. That's at 3 p.m. Have a great evening.